Hello, all. This is the owl. And oh, right, baby. So, our little Faputa was born towards the end of February, and I do want to say a massive thank you to everyone who donated or patroned up. It's really going to help us because the birth was a bit complicated. Regarding the mobile reward, we will post a photo of it once we stabilize. And yes, I know a few people asked for an extra week, so sure. Otherwise, it's time to shake off the dust. And in order to get back into the saddle, let's finish off that video that I was in the middle of getting ready before Baby Owl put in an appearance. Yes, what you're listening to is partially a script that I'd recorded over a month ago, literally just before Mrs. Owl went into labor. So apologies if there's a bit of an audio difference right about now. This is going to be a bit of a weird one, as Nakayama, hmm, Let's just say the word character comes to mind. And that's only because Certified Weirdo has already been claimed by Tsukushi in perpetuity in a few of Masaki Nakayama's other stories, including Fuan no Tane. He would occasionally do these sort of autobiographical segments where he would go over weird, sometimes mildly supernatural experiences he's had, some of which are silly or odd, and others are legitimately freaky, but always straddling a line as thick as a flea's ball hair between, yeah, that's one hell of a creepy story, and yeah, you're talking directly out of your ass, mate. Now, rather a large chunk of PTSD radio, especially the last two volumes, are taken up by one of these. But it's a bit different this time. As you read, you gradually realize that this is the story of where PTSD radio and quite a few bits of Fuanotane actually come from. You'll see what I mean. And this means that before you watch this video, I would strongly recommend watching my PTSD radio video series. Yeah, that will never not be a weird sequence of words. And if you don't mind the jank, my Fuanotane videos too. Yes, they're not great. I should really redo those, and I only say this because it'll add quite a bit. When watching this, you'll go, oh, so that's where that came from. Still, yeah, what starts off as a weird story about a rental space in Sapporo turns into a Lovecraftian tale of madness, the near death of several people, curses, hauntings, and the closure of a long-running manga magazine. Now, before we dive into this one, a word of warning. I know that this sort of story can freak people out. The whole cursed media leaking out into real life is a lot less fun boogity boo scary and more I'm 40 years old and I am not going to sleep tonight without my lights on scary, so I am going to give you the option of bailing on this one right now. Because I won't lie, just writing the script left me a little twitchy, as Mrs. Owl will attest after entering the room without me noticing, asking if I wanted coffee, and then needing to replace part of the ceiling. If you're going to stick around, this one's a bit hard to follow, but also really, really freaky. 
With that out of the way, let's take a look. So, Nakayama's story jumps around in time a bit. We start with a brief narrative set before he began work on PTSD radio, probably during his Fuanotane days back in Sapporo. And as I'll remind you during the story, it's a little hard to follow at times. So I'm going to be moving a few things around to try and work out the chronology and help it all make sense. Apologies for the stuff I get wrong. In a nutshell, looking for a space to work in, Nakayama and his assistants were able to find both a business space and an apartment for him in an apartment building owned by a cheerful old bugger in a busy part of town, and they were taken aback by how ridiculously cheap the rent was, and despite this being prime real estate, them being the only tenants. And yeah, I will attest to how weird this is, because in the middle of the business district, rents in Japan tend to be insane, and that's if you can find anything. But of course, as they worked there, they began to experience some, well, let's put it bluntly, some full-on Amityville shenanigans after encountering a few flies and something that stank of rotting meat, and also having one assistant abruptly quit for no reason Nakayama began exploring the space after hours, investigating every nook and cranny. But while he never found the dead mouse or whatever he suspected might be emitting that smell, he did find a strange package at the back of a shelf at the top of a cupboard, which contained a piece of a desecrated home shrine. And no, I'm not even going into home shrines today. That's another disco biscuit entirely. But let's just say, imagine you move into a new house, but every so often you get the reek of decaying flesh and sea flies. Eventually, leading you to investigate the basement where you find a smashed crucifix and a bunch of cat skeletons. Yeah, you'd be mildly freaked out at least. The weirdness got worse and worse, culminating in a bizarre encounter with the usually friendly landlord, who out of nowhere became furious and very nearly violent, which on top of the other weird shit, caused Nakayama to just nope out and go in search of another building. Sometime later, despite still being a bit rattled, he began telling his assistants about the weirdness that had transpired, but as soon as he started doing this, he began experiencing horrific physical symptoms, including finding old rotting blood in his mouth and necrosis of his gums, naturally causing him to rush to the hospital where he ended up spending a few months being treated for what turned out to be the sudden onset of a rare, bizarre, idiopathic platelet disorder that came exceedingly close to killing him. Sometime later, he talked about the incident with a friend and amateur occultist who wondered if maybe he'd fallen victim to the curse of some local Shinto deity. I might have gone into this in part two 
of my PTSD radio series. But yeah, this is a thing in Japan. Small, local gods, very similar to Roman Lares and Penates, or African spirits, frequently capricious, cruel, and easily offended. And yeah, offending these deities is still a thing in modern Japan. And a lot of Nakayama's storytelling ties into this fear of getting the attention of the supernatural. Regardless, Nakayama did eventually recover and return to work, shortly after which he was approached by the aforementioned assistant who quit out of the blue. She told him the reason was that her grandmother, a fortune teller, had told her that there was something really bad in that building, and that regardless of her job, she had to get out of there as fast as possible. Which, yeah, that's kind of spooky, especially when Nakayama muses about what's happening in that building now. And yeah, he published that story in PTSD Radio, thinking that it was done and in the past. But in doing so, and I'm guessing the timing here is before, during, and after the publication of Volume 5, leading us to what happened after this story, which is where this goes from a creepy little tale to full-on supernup. But before that, let's take a short break. <laughs> Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Anywho, Nakayama goes on to explain exactly what happened after he started to publish the IRL story of his adventures in his previous building in Nemesis, a slightly obscure but long-running seinen magazine. And telling the story seemed to prompt more weird stuff to begin happening. For instance, at a meeting one day, a good luck charm that they'd stuck to the ceiling, no, I'm not even going into those, suddenly came unstuck and fell down onto the table near them, giving them all a bit of a fright. Clocks and electronics would sometimes just go haywire or stop working entirely. It escalated further when he brought the occultist who he told previously to speak at a panel. As he began talking, something started banging on the walls, so loudly that it began to freak the audience out. Nakayama began to suspect that he attracted something's attention by telling his story, and decided to go full on It Follows by offloading whatever the hell this might be onto someone else, telling a local collector of urban legends and spooky stories what had happened, and that he could use it for his own anecdotes. Sure enough, after trying to tell the story, the chap experienced illness, something out of the blue destroyed the rear wheel of his bike, as if he'd collided with a truck, and then, just randomly, he tripped and landed badly, full-on breaking his arm. He tried to laugh it off, but Nakayama was beginning to freak out. Then, his editor suggested that Nakayama continue telling the story in Nemesis, as the previous one about the apartment and the desecrated shrine had apparently sold really well 
After, you know, nearly dying, Nakayama was rather reluctant. But he eventually got talked around into doing it because, well, money. But suddenly, as he and his editor were talking, a water droplet landed on Nakayama's arm, startling him. He stood up, looking for the source, but he was nowhere near the AC unit and the ceiling above him was dry. Now totally freaked out, he just told his editor to drop it. Wow, that's <laughs> And before we get into the next part, a quick story from me. While I was recording this, I had to stop and start because I felt something wet on the top of my frigging head. And not wanting to stop talking, I just carried on. I paused it, turned around, there was nothing there. And yeah, I think my butt might have left bite marks on my own chair. I am not kidding. This shit is freaky, yo. Let's continue because... Ugh. So yeah. Despite Nakayama refusing to publish the rest of his story, he did evidently decide to go ahead with it at some point, although it could be that this part of the story occurs sometime later. While he doesn't actually mention it here, Nemesis eventually went out of business. Yeah, that happened. And it's probably why Fuan no Tane Asterisk is giving me such a hard time tracking down even a legal Japanese copy. So, sometime later, no, I can't be more specific than that, Nakayama did decide to tell the story. And in order to do so, he wanted to check out what had been going on in the old quite possibly cursed apartment building, as well as the people who had heard the story. And fair warning, Nakayama describes this story as contagious, in that those who remember it well enough to tell other people about, generally have creepy stuff begin to happen to them, and some of them do end up getting sick, or being injured, or both. I'm going to push forwards, but if you want out, come on back for the next one. For those staying, yeah, this is where things get scary. Back at the apartment building, where he went with a few assistants, including the one with the psychic grandmother, the floor he had rented was now completely vacant, and seemingly had been for years. Maybe word had gotten around about this place. They started exploring and found that the tenant entrance smelled horrific. On closer inspection, they realized that the stink was coming from a specific unit. They decided to investigate, found the door was unlocked, but when Nakayama tried to open it, the smell was just too bad, and he just noped out. After telling one of the assistants about it, he decided to go and check it out and return saying that, yeah, the smell is mind-blowing. But when he went into the unit, it looked completely fine and totally normal. Except for one thing, here and there, floor panels had been removed and under them, surprisingly deep holes, which was very odd. 
because it was on the first floor and there was no basement to the building. At least, nothing official. Yeah, anyone getting the Borderlands vibes here? Because that is creepy. Anyway, the assistant tried looking into the holes, but they were too dark to make anything out. So, in a foul-smelling deserted unit, in an apartment building, that may well be cursed by some ancient, deeply offended being whose shrine has been desecrated. There are mysterious holes in the ground leading to a deep, dark space under the building. Yeah, this is the part of the movie where you leave and never come back. But nope. Instead, they told the other assistant. I think this is the one with the psychic grandmother. She was curious, so she decided to go over, I think that night, and check it out herself. Nakayama tried to dissuade her, saying that the landlord was a bit of a weirdo, and that he really didn't want to piss him off again. But she was insistent. She was going to sneak back in late at night, and she said that she'd take her phone with her so she could shine a light down those halls, maybe take some photographs, yeah. Regardless, they never heard from her again. Damn, Nakayama left her several voicemails, but never got a response, and she never showed up at work again either. I'm guessing that they decided to leave it alone and went back to work. One evening, they were working late when one of the assistants yelled out in fright, saying that, ah oh, damn it man, there was a huge crow looking in through the window. Which, okay, I'm guessing we now know where that bit came from. As soon as the assistant said this, Nakayama turned around, saw something, but in an instant, it was gone without a sound. They investigated and then got a bit weirded out because the window was closed, despite her saying that the crow had been poking through. And there was a railing constructed in such a manner that the bird would have had nowhere to perch. Yeah, a lot of PTSD radio is now making sense. Sometime later, another assistant came in and bawled everyone out, saying that one of them had been standing just outside the bathroom while she was doing her business, none of them had left the room. Defensive, she described seeing an indistinct outline of someone's head through the glass. Just an indistinct black outline. Damn it, man! Then, again later, one night, after lights out, and they were preparing to knock off and head home. An assistant asked if there was supposed to be anyone in the office down the hall, because there was someone or something standing just outside. This sort of phenomenon kept happening. An assistant or Nakayama himself working late would see a weird, black, shadowy thing, and in the case of an assistant, would then abruptly quit, sometimes also falling ill. And yeah, again, you can see a lot of this story's DNA throughout PTSD radio, and to be honest, some parts of Fuan no Tane. Mysterious illnesses, eerie shapes at night, impossible crows, all bookended by the story 
of a powerful supernatural being who'd gone insane due to the desecration of its shrine. And then something happened. One last story. I think this might be where Nakayama said, bugger it, and moved to Tokyo. He was alone in the office one night, busy packing for the move. Nakayama refuses to say any more, aside from it having to do with that horrible black shape, and that this part of the story he will take to his grave. Whatever the truth of it, whether it was something to do with the shrine or whatever was under the building that was making that horrible smell down in that weird black space that, by all rights, shouldn't even be there. Yeah, it's a definitely unnerving thought. What exactly was making that smell? What could have been down there? And did they somehow manage to wake it up and then it followed them back home? Either way, Nakayama ends with him saying that this is it, the end. But he does ask if any of the assistants who left without saying anything could please get back in contact with him. And yeah, that's actually not the end. Because after this, he did volume 6, which, as I explained in my previous video, was very odd. And there is a final part to the story, which we'll take a look at right now. So, yeah, after the final story of the final volume, the one with the creepy upside down face kid, which, you know, never appeared before volume 6. So I wonder if this had something to do with whatever Nakayama saw. It seemed that Nakayama wanted to continue writing volume 7, but never did. And then he explains why. See, Something happened as he prepared to move again. Something involving the reeking shadowy thing that he spoke of before. Something that he will never share with anyone else. And while he doesn't do it here, he does explain that whenever he's about to, something weird happens. Someone gets sick or gets injured, and the meeting ends up being cancelled. He kept going on Volume 6, or maybe this was him starting Volume 7, it's a little ambiguous, but he put a bit of the story into it, then woke up one morning with half of his face swollen up like a balloon, and after using a thermometer, Rather than being feverish, he was severely hypothermic. Worried that he was actually dying this time, he remembered that he'd written down what had happened to him, and now paranoid, he crumpled it up and replaced it with what we actually got, which might be why Volume 6 has that extended and very out-of-place story about the girl and the dog. And after doing this, he immediately felt a bit better. So he went to a local hospital where they examined him and by then they couldn't find a single thing wrong with him. Which was when he decided that this was as clear a signal as he was going to get. Something was telling him in his words, don't tell anyone. We won't allow you to say any more. And yeah, that's where PTSD Radio ended. With 
this little afterword where he basically goes, yeah, I'm not going to write any more of this manga because something pretty horrible is now following me and telling me not to. Just, <laughs> nope, 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 nope. This is the sort of story that freaks my damn balls off, and the fact that things start happening while I was recording this, bloody hell, man. But there's more. Right at the end of the volume, we get a few disconnected panels. And yeah, that's the spooky old building. So I wonder if this is Nakayama giving us a bit of a hint. We see the building, and then we notice that the shadows being cast by the junk surrounding it make a vague outline of eyes looking at you. No thanks. And then there's this. A flat, malformed face with empty black eye sockets peering up over something and looking at you. Was this what Nakayama saw? I'd like to think that, no, it's not. And this entire thing was made up as an excuse to stop writing PTSD radio, or at least I really bloody hope so. Because either way, screw this story. And let's end it there. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed that. Before we finish for the day, I want to give a huge Fright Ranker thank you as always, to my fantastic patrons, Asterix Gaming, Cheerful Satanist, Starwin Marwin, High Lord J, Jacob Ramsey, Crazy, James Bakes Bread, Wargle, Cal Kor, Lance Goebel, Paul Norberger, Piece of Yeast, Rafferty, Aaron Arnold, The Hedgehog Gamer, Simone, and XTC Pill. If you want to see more like this, why not stick around? Subscribe, bell, you know what to do. If you want to hear me say your name, get early access to most of my videos, have some fun perks on the Discord, and, you know, help Mrs. Owl and I out, or buy Baby Owl a present, and ensure that I can keep doing what I do, why not take a look at our Patreon? All links are in the description. Take care, my friends, and cheers. This is The Owl, signing off.